Let's come straight to Mark Harper now. He's the chair of the COVID recovery group of, co uh, of Conservative MPs and is a former chief whip. Um, Mark Harper, um, good morning to you. Y you have been fighting valiantly. Morning, with, Julia. Good morning, with many dozens of other Tory MPs for the Prime Minister to get us out of lockdown sooner. Looking at the data, you've been calling for measures to uh, change as soon as we've had uh, all over 70s vaccinated and three weeks for that to start. March, of, March the 8th, really, is not the start of things. It should be the, the Big Bang uh, getting out of lockdown. What is your feeling about what the Prime Minister had to say yesterday then? Well, look, it, I think it was sort of, if you like, you use the football analogy, a game of two halves. I was really pleased uh, that he announced that all schools and all pupils are going to be back on the 8th of March. We called for that very strongly in our letter that we wrote to the Prime Minister uh, last week. Uh, so I'm really pleased he's delivering that. Um, you and I have discussed this before. Huge harm to children for not being in school. So that's good. Um, I think it's really welcome that there's now a date set for all restrictions going, uh, which is the 21st of June. I suppose my disappointment is that uh, I asked the Prime Minister this yesterday in the House. Um, I, I argued and the group argued that that could have happened at the end of April once uh, all, all the risk groups are vaccinated, the groups that account for 99% of deaths. Um, it's been delayed by about two months. And it appears to have been delayed because of, of some modelling, uh, which I think has got some flawed assumptions. I, I'm not criticising the, the universities doing the modelling, but oh, the yes, assumptions that have be. been given by the government. Um, well, I think if, if I think the modelling, Julia, is that it depends on the assumptions. And the assumptions have been given to them by the government, by the cabinet office. Uh, Mark, I'm afraid your line is... Your, 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 uh, Mark, they're, they're not, Mark, apologies to interrupt, Mark. I don't know if you can hear me, but your, your line keeps uh, cutting out. It looks like the robots have, have got in. We're, we're going to try and persevere, but just for people who didn't hear what you had to say then. See, the, the government released a whole load of data yesterday, and, and one of the sets of data they released was these computer models that they've been looking at, the best-case, worst-case scenarios for the for, for easing lockdown. And they it appear to have gone one particular scenario uh, is sort of in the middle of those. Um, but, but those computer models, they did not... Not, they, well, they made assumptions, as you say, based on uh, having a vaccine rollout that hasn't rolled out anything like to the extent that it has rolled out, so therefore it wouldn't be as effective, and that the vaccines wouldn't be as effective as they are. Um, and they've assumed no seasonality in the virus, and that is the weather gets warmer, we're going to see fewer cases, um, despite clear evidence there is seasonality with this virus. Um, those computer models aren't worth the paper they're printed on, are they? Well, I think the problem is it, it's it's the whole phrase about garbage in and garbage out. If you give them a dodgy assumptions, then you're going to get dodgy answers. And and I think, as you've just said, they they undercall the take up of the vaccine, which has been fantastic. They undercall the performance of the vaccine, um, and so I think they make unduly pessimistic assumptions. And the problem with that delay is that that delay in unlocking is, I'm, I'm afraid, probably going to cost the jobs uh, of people listening to the show and, and cost people their businesses. And, and that's obviously very disappointing. Well, indeed, you say disappointed, but this is it. It, it. People talk about this being a cautious approach. And I am absolutely stunned by the, the YouGov polling that suggests that 46% of people think the balance is about right. 26% astonishingly um, I'm able to uh, say they was too quick. I'm amazed they were able to get out from under, behind their sofas where they've clearly been hiding for the last year if they think this is too quick. Um, but but this is it. Is there not an element where the government is now being held hostage by Sage, by Valance and Witty? I mean, unless they agree to any policy, nah, -uh, it doesn't happen because the press are going to say, do you agree with this policy, Chris Witty or, or Patrick Valance? And if they don't, then all hell breaks loose. So the prime minister has to do whatever it they say. They are obsessed with one virus at the expense of all other things, along with Sage, as opposed to all the other risks uh, to our, our, our health, our mental health, our, our, our economy and, and long term problems. Um, and then a lot of this is being driven by by the opinion polling. We've so we've got we've got government adverts terrifying the living daylights out of people uh, about the risk of COVID, um, and then people are terrified, and then people demand more measures, and then the government says, "Well, you know, people are terrified; they're demanding more measures." Do you not think the solution to a lot of this is a proper education program explaining the actual risks to actual people from COVID if you are under sixty? 
a healthy person who's not morbidly obese and that your risks of catching, uh, getting seriously ill or dying of coronavirus are minusculely small. And indeed for our children, your risk of going to school and catching COVID and dying of it are lower than your risks of getting hit by lightning and dying of that on the way to school. Do we not need an educational programme organised by the government to explain to people why we should be lo uh, easing the lockdown sooner? Yeah, well, I do think you made some very good points there about how we explain to people risk and how people judge risk uh, against all of the other risks we face. And there are some really good people in broadcasting, uh, David Spiegelhalter, for example, who looks at how you present some of these issues in a way that's balanced uh, and accurate and reasonable. And I, I do think there's a role for that uh, in politics. Um, you know, politicians are often very good with words. Uh, and less good with numbers. I know when I was a, a minister, often I'd have beautifully written submissions, and then you'd look at the numbers and the data and the evidence underpinning them, and some sometimes that left quite a lot to be desired. So I, I do think there's a role there for, for, for educating people about how to balance risk. Um, but as I said, I, I think it's disappointing about the pace, uh, because I think there are going to be some real consequences about that. So it's great that we've got a date, but I, I think it could have been uh, earlier without putting people at any greater risk. Realistically, are there any consequences for the government for not moving sooner? Um, given that public, we are told by the polls, and I'm just not 100% convinced that these polls are very accurate, um, uh, and uh, I'm sure from the people you know as well. Um, people seem to want lockdown rules for other people, but not for themselves. I, I, they genuinely think that they and their family and friends can behave responsibly and make personal decisions, but others can't. But, but in terms of consequences of the Prime Minister, um, the idea that this government, under emergency legislation, a year after um, uh, we had the emergency, we're no longer in an emergency right now, stretching the term quite a lot can continue to take away our freedoms the right of people to go to you know have businesses to 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 move freely without wearing a face mask to um uh, you know to, to meet their family to travel to, to leave the country the idea that they're able to do that uh, with only sort of bare scrutiny by by cabinet barely anything more than uh, a sort of a talking shop in in the house of parliament um and yet they're able to do that for months and months and months on end and possibly even for 18 months in total. Um, that is quite extraordinary in a democracy. And yet there doesn't seem to be any sort of anyone kicking back at this. Are you not concerned that this could happen again next winter? This could happen any time the government deems there is an emergency and can scare the living daylights of the public and that we have lost our fundamental freedoms forever? Well, I think you raise a couple of very important points there. One, I think, is the framework of the law underpinning these sorts of um, measures, I think, leaves a, a great deal to be desired. And, and my colleague, Steve Bake, has been pushing very hard for a new public health act, a new way we deal with these sorts of issues, where there's much more parliamentary scrutiny, much more control, uh, and, and much more challenge to ministers to justify the decisions they're taking. And I, I think that's a very sound argument. Um, on the issue about consequences, I think it'll depend a bit on, on public opinion. One of the things I'm a little disappointed about, uh, again, is, is the if we see the data, we keep being told it's data, not date. If we see the data more encouraging, you know, we see deaths and hospitalizations fall quickly as we roll out the vaccine, I would have hoped that you could have therefore unlocked more quickly. But it seems the government's determined to stick to this timetable, even if the data turns out to be better than hopes. And I, I hope they think again about that, because if the data is very positive, and we've even heard some government scientists suggest this, if the data moves in the right direction more quickly, then I would hope the measures could be eased more quickly as well to reflect the data.